Welcome to the Game of the Impossible episode 3. Last week we talked about how do you set a true north and um, ultimately how do you set goals and today as a follow-up to that we're going to be talking about how do you then have a discipline of action in order to bring those goals to fruition. Uh, that the discipline of action is something that you talk a lot about um, in your firm Pomandu Associates and in your previous work as well. Um, can you tell us what do you mean when you say a discipline of action? Let me begin by defining the words. According to the Oxford Dictionary, the word discipline is defined as the practice of training people to obey rules and codes of behavior using punishment or incentives uh, to, to make sure that they achieve that. Punishment to correct disobedience and uh, in incentives to get them to reward them, to incentivize them. The, the term action is defined as the fact or a process of doing something typically to achieve an objective. So if you combine the two words, then you really have a body of knowledge or a process that allows the organization that people work in the organization to achieve set objectives by following what I call the six hexagonal principles of uh, discipline of action. Can you tell us what those six uh, six points of the hexagon are? Let me just run them through quickly so that we go and go into detail later on. The first one is to produce a, a detailed operational plan for people to do. Secondly, to communicate the plan to everybody. And thirdly, you must have a dashboard to monitor progress or lack of progress. And the fourth thing is to make sure that you hold people accountable for delivering on those targets that are set and being monitored. And uh, the fifth thing is to make sure that there's problem solving. And this problem solving is very important that when things are not done according to the schedule, there will have to be problem solving to resolve them. The finally, the sixth part of the hexagon is to make sure that taking cue from the changes that are coming out from the problem solving session, there will be tactical changes in the operational plans because the operational plans when you start them they appear to be cast in concrete but as you go into implementation there are a lot of changes that need to be made so those were the six aspects of the hexagonal uh, discipline of action yeah you know a lot of what you shared there it sounds very I think these are all structures that seem very doable and, and feasible within a corporate setting yeah. or within a wider team setting but I wonder if Let's say you were someone who was either a student or maybe you're not operating in a team environment. Maybe you are, let's say you are a stay-at-home uh, mom. What might a discipline of action or a system, systematic discipline of action look like in that context? Yeah. Let's take a family, you know, father and, uh, father and mother want to introduce discipline of action and how their family needs to run. It's most important for them to set up an operational plan. What is it that they are trying to do in the family? Without that plan, then the sons and the daughters will be doing their own thing and there's no cohesion in the things that they're doing. So they, they set an operational plan. It's important that the plan is not just set by the father and the mother. All of them in the family are actually sitting down there to create their operational plan. So in that operational plan, the activities of what each of them is supposed to do in the household, who is going to do what, when they're going to do it, what is the expectation, and clear dashboard that they will have to monitor and so that's basically what it is. They have to set an objective, which we covered in the first, as in the second uh, episode uh, that we talked about setting, anchoring on the true north. That needs to come in the operational plan. So when they start doing that, then they have to communicate it among themselves. Really communicate. Who else is in the household? You may have servants there. You have, may have grass cutters, people that tend to the garden. They need to be part of the process in communicating it so that they, everybody knows it. And then you have to set up a dashboard. That means every Friday you have a look at it, what has been achieved or not achieved to go and achieve the objective. Then you have to make sure that you have to do a problem solving to resolve that when the things are not being done. You have to discuss and how to resolve them and then making changes to the operational plan along the way in the sixth part of the hexagon. So this idea of the six hexagonal aspects of discipline of action works in a corporate world, in a family. I can also say it can work among students as well. What is that looking like for you right now? Since you are on sabbatical, have you been, how have you been? Give us some examples of how you've been maybe applying some of this 
you know, with between you and mom and some of the projects that you are working on yeah. right now at home. So what we, what we are doing is that I mean this is part of the my sabbatical. One you and I agreed to do this. We've agreed that we will do it every Friday, and then that's the discipline we have to do it. Setting up this room, making sure it's all set out, the lighting is all done. This is part of the discipline. I should and probably the, do a separate series on showing <laughs> all of the behind the scenes in putting this together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even like, mom and I want to do this little project at the farm, which is a hobby of ours, to try and raise some pheasants. You know, it required, we knew in the first week, we'll have to make sure that the, the, the house is ready. We had to get the contractors to build it, the operational plan, exactly how thick and how how big the holes is to make sure snakes don't enter into the into there to, to kill the, the, the chicks. I think so, the problem solving is very evident in this because absolutely uh, you you so you know, for, for for those who <laughs> haven't listened to the previous I think it's in the first episode where we right, talked yeah. about this which was about your new hobby or or, or project of rearing and, and farming pheasants hmm. uh, not peasants but but pheasants uh, in in our farm and I know that you know we have since taken delivery of I yeah. think I believe it's twenty chicks. twenty chicks some are pheasants mainly pheasants but some quail uh, quail as well yeah. and uh, there have been some some casualties absolutely <laughs> yeah <laughs> because you about the so the first solving. week we already had three casualties and and then this second week we now have two casualties so I began to research what might be the cause for the casualty they, they died actually and we found out there were big holes one of them got the legs were strapped inside the holes of the the floor on the, the cage so i had to make sure that there are no big holes that allow them to be trapped and trampled by the other chicks the other one is they had problems with it being cold it's been raining lately yeah so so therefore we have to make sure that the cages have protection at night that we cover them and bring them out so this is part of the tender loving care but we have to find solutions to this the other one solutions we found was i had to order from shopee some lighting for warmer to keep them warm at night so these are problem solving i had not known this until i because i've not i've not been trained to be a breeder of pheasants before or chicks so uh, in the kampong we just put them in the in the hut and then they know what to do but these are more challenging things to do but they are really part and parcel of what we're doing yeah and i suppose you wouldn't actually be able to learn if not for i mean let, let's call this you know small small failures or, or yeah. hurdles um, but if you had tried to anticipate every single yeah. uh, you know mishap that could go wrong you could argue that you would have maybe never started never have, never the process started. Yeah. of doing this <laughs> and so i think the reflection here for a lot of the stuff that i do as well uh, is to just not be afraid of beginning i think this podcast is another example mm -hmm. uh, we were looking at the first episode that just you know that we that we that went live and uh, i think just reflecting on some things that we could have done could do better yeah in fact maybe let us know uh, we have been discussing whether or not this background is a little much uh, this is the natural setting of this study but we have been considering maybe we need to spruce it up a bit for the sake of the podcast it looks a little cluttered it, it does look a bit cluttered but <laughs> it goes back to the point of you know is, is if we had not decided to just film and go live and proceed with it yeah we wouldn't then have the the basis for which to make improvements and so sometimes i think that's it's another thing that you touch on and i think in subsequent episodes we'll, mm. we'll go a bit deeper into it but you you talk a lot about the fear of failure yeah, yeah. and actually a discipline of action i i believe is it starts with being okay to fail you yeah. obviously do what you can to mitigate that but there's a certain point at which you you can't you can't anticipate certain sure. things anymore and you just need to begin and so there's this constant recurring process of you know starting the thing executing mm. but then problem solving and refining and mm -hmm. that is ultimately this yeah, iterative yeah. approach uh, yeah. is something that you uh, that, that you guys do in the firm as well i believe Absolutely. so maybe talk a little bit more about the value of taking an iterative approach to to things yeah we have a rule as i said in the earlier podcast the one third, one third, one third rule. I begin with the premise, but however good the plans are, only one third of those in the plans will be implemented exactly as per the plans. Another third will be modified in implementation because implementation, a lot of changes has to be made and refined. The third one is you have not even thought about them because some of the old plans don't work. So you have to come with new ideas, new plans to do it. The one third completely new. Because we begin with that notion, 
that things are not going to be exactly as per plan, we already assume that to be the case. And so therefore, my view is that don't spend too much time perfecting the plan. We have a plan that you say, we're going to be iterative in implementation, make changes along the way. So let's not spend six months working the plans. So my view is that an optimum time to spend on operational plan is no more than six weeks. Spend time, not six months, not a whole year, six weeks, work out the detail, even in a large organization, that's good enough. In, in, a, in, in a country, when I was in government, we allowed people to run the operational plan no more than six weeks. Because we begin with the assumption, we're going to be iterative in implementation because it's not going to be perfect. So go out and do it, implement it, and make changes along the way. I think in a world that is fast changing today, versatility and adaptability is absolutely key. Anyone that say that I'm rigid and so disciplined, that means you can't make the changes along the way in implementation, is going to be completely outdated in no time because changes, things move so rapidly. Yeah. Tell us a bit about how you, um, how do you then craft a detailed and very granular um, action plan in the things that you do? And, and these are, I think it's also worth noting, maybe draw specific examples to some of the more uh, macro scale yeah, projects. Yeah. For example, uh, the, you know, the NTP that you did in your time yeah. in government. Yeah. Yeah. So, the first one is indeed, as you said, the, the how to put up, establish a detailed operational plan. So in a large organization, as you say, micro, it is very important to run what I call laboratories, getting the best people from various disciplines to come together into a laboratory and tell them the true north, tell them in the next six weeks, they have to come with a consensus and detailed operational plan on how to do it. And that's what we do. And they need facilitators there. A laboratory is, is a very important area where they need to do that. So when they come there, they all sit together, analyze the problem, put the data on the table. Then they look at the problem solving, trying to resolve the problem and lay down step by step on a weekly basis who is going to do what and when. Uh, let me give you an example of what we were trying to do. Way back when I was in, uh, in government, we had a huge problem with street crime. Crime was rising continuously every year uh, for the last five years. At the time when I went there, it was 2009. It was very alarming because every single year, street crime was rising. Not all crime, but street crime in particular. So we had a lab on how to do this. We told people, I recall there were 120 people, there were police inside there, people from residents in the areas were there, and there were... Uh, experts in, in this area and a lot of people were inside there. the finance people in the government were there and representative from the from the associations the construction uh, the property companies were there six weeks it was incredible they analyzed what to do it they came with very simple ideas on how to resolve it the first one was they looked at all the data of all the incidents of crime that took place in Malaysia over the last 10 years, and they found out the majority of them were committed to in specific hotspots because the data is in with the police when they downloaded the data. More than 80% of the street crime were committed in exactly the hotspots. But the problem was the police were deployed geographically based on acreages, mm. not based on hotspots. Yeah. So the lab recommended that we have changed the redeployment of the police and put the police into the specific crime hotspots. And so that was one of the recommendations to identify exactly where we're going to put the police there, where the hotspots were and what time of the day were the crime committed. So we deployed altogether 29,000 police from the non-hotspot areas into the hotspot areas. That's one. And we knew exactly how many. And the other thing that was needed was we also agreed they recommended that we will put CCTVs because CCTVs were very effective and we installed CCTVs in all the hotspot areas. And then from then on, there were dashboard that determined exactly whether the crime was coming down or up. So we had problem solving sessions that were coming out in the plan, but it was really incredible. But the results were astounding. Over a period of five years, 
we were able to reduce the incidence of street crime in, in Malaysia by 53%. That's quite phenomenal, actually, for a short time that we did this. And when we looked inside the lab, the lab was also, in defining the operational plan, they also looked at best practices in other countries. And they found out that the best practice for doing a similar thing was New York Police Department. That's why they did an NYPD, how they were able to reduce the incidence of street crime. So every single year, as we followed the operational plan, we were seeing a steep decline in the incidence of street crime. So I suppose in your case, um, you know, based on this example, actually a large driver to that uh, is accountability. Yeah. You know, the fact that you, you, you communicate exactly what you want to do, um, but you also have these regular check-ins uh, by way of the dashboard as well to make sure that things happen. Are there any other, um, you know, in, in doing this, were there... Were there times where you experienced challenges? I think the, the reason why I ask is in the context of, you know, socioeconomic transformation, you're dealing with many, many different parties outside of your own team. So, you know, you have your civil servants as well yeah, yeah. Uh, that, you're, that you're dealing with. How do you sort of shift the culture? Because we know that you'll be working with some parties who maybe have less of a action or proactive. Yeah, yeah. Culture. That's part of problem solving. For example, when we went to implement the operational plan for street crime, one of the recommendations was to redeploy the police hutan. We had a lot of police who are in the station at the border next to uh, Thailand. They were there because of the communist insurgency in the 60s. So they were there. But we don't have communist insurgencies. They're still there. But the recommendation was to redeploy about 11,000 or kind of 14,000 uh, of them into the crime hotspot areas. It was difficult because they were like border scouts. They were, rep they were employed by the military rather than the police. So we'll have to get them to come out there and agree uh, that they could now report to and a police superintendent in, in, in the area. And that's not an easy code for military people and the, and the police to come and work together. But in this particular case, it was important for the Home Minister to talk to the Minister of Defence to make sure that they agree. And then the military chief together with the police, they all agree and they agreed the code of conduct, how they, how they could do this. So it was a very challenging thing. But, you know, when we started to do this, there was money that's going to be involved. We have to spend money transporting them, bringing them, relocating them, giving them new vehicle to transport, giving houses to them. So it was a huge challenge to get resources to do this. So fortunately, when we spoke to the minister, which is in charge, finance minister, also the minister of finance, they were able to then deploy it, give us the money. Even money for CCTV is very important. So these are very difficult things. Making the simple change to redeploy people, the police, based on hotspot is a huge bureaucratic challenge. We had resistance because the police said, the rule book says we must deploy based on geography. We cannot redeploy based on hotspot. What did we do? Change the rule book. If you don't change the rule book, they cannot do it because if they do it, what will happen at the end of the year, there will be an auditor Auditor General will put up the rule and say we redeploy people outside the scope of the regulation. And so the rule book has to change. So a lot of resistance that will come. Many of them were identified as resistance in the lab. So we resolved them in the lab. There were many resistance that came in the implementation. So the problem solving sessions that we had on a weekly basis were the avenues to solve those problems. Yeah. And you would need to have that weekly checkpoint to problem solve because I don't think you would be able, again, it goes back to what we said earlier, you would not be able to anticipate a lot of these problems. I mean, sure, you would you would roughly know that there would be some resistance um, at that level. Um, but obviously, there will be certain things that only come up in implementation. So I think that that is key, having those regular checkpoints um, to problem solve. I, I do wonder, you know, just this is kind of backtracking a little bit, yeah. but... There was a there, there was a a study that I thought was interesting and it said that self-discipline outdoes IQ in predicting academic performance by more than 50%. Oh yeah. <laughs> so if that is the case, 
You know, I often wonder, and I, this is a question that I ask myself as well, because I think discipline is not something that I, I have innately, I don't think. Uh, it's something that I have to engineer. It's a bit like how, in your case, yeah. in that example, you changed you changed the environment, i.e., you changed the <laughs> you changed the policies yeah. in order to get you know your your police to to play ball. So I think in my case, I've had to engineer how do I m make myself a, a person that is a bit more disciplined, you know, because I realized that I have I think often relied a lot on on on, on talent and natural smarts. But then I really started to think of late, and this has been the encouragement when wanting to pursue mm. new things. Actually, I don't need to be the smartest or brightest person in that whatever discipline that is. I just need to adopt now a discipline mm. of action. Uh, what are some good habits that will allow me to do that thing for over a longer period of time? Um, do you have any thoughts as to, you know, why, why is it that discipline outweighs intelligence or let's just say for the sake of argument talent yeah i completely agree with that idea you know so if you don't have an operational plan you will not find people acting on it because most of us are i would say innately people are kind of born lazy we don't want hard work so we work hard to find we use this word a lot at home we say <laughs> we say that things are leche yeah uh, very leche it's true because we, we, we want to find efficient ways to yeah. do it so that we don't have to work very hard. That's yeah. the human being, nature of human being. Yeah, we say if you want to find a way to do something efficiently, hire a lazy person to do the job. <laughs> <laughs> so that's important, important to do it. So if you, have, if you have a very detailed plan, but you know, most of us really challenge every single day to exercise the discipline to do that. It's not an easy thing to do because the natural thing to do is to sit and we have the freedom to do what you want to do, but not following the discipline. It's very difficult. Creating routine is a very difficult thing. Sticking people to do routine is a challenge in itself. It's very difficult, changing behavior. So I do believe that if you don't, if you cannot manage self, you cannot manage others, nor can you manage an organization. So it's a precondition to be able to be a good leader, a good manager. You first must know how to manage yourself be able to have the discipline to go and do the things you said you were going to do. It is very important. If you want to become a leader in managing an organization, a leader in managing a country, if you can't even manage yourself in the discipline, you can't even begin to do that because people can see through you. So it's very, very, people had said, when talent does not work hard, hard work beats talent. It's the same idea that uh, you referred to. And I do believe that's very, very important. But I do think like this. Just like athletes, you ran the marathon. The more you practice, in the beginning, it's very difficult. But the more you run, the more you develop the stamina to be able to run. Yeah. In the same way, the more you exercise the discipline to wake up in the morning to do what you said you were supposed to do for the day, the more you keep that habit, the more the habit grows to become part of you. Mm. And in no time, one or two weeks or two months later, you'll find that you're completely changed because what was so difficult to do before become natural for you yeah. to do. There's two components to it. I think number one, if you prioritize that thing, you will naturally find a way to work stuff in your life around the thing so that you are able to do it. Yeah. I think that's one thing. But then to your point, actually in, 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 in sticking to that habit, you then start to grow uh, in your capacity as well and ability to take on more. Yeah, you know, a simple uh, analogy is in in I I also used to lift weights. I still do a little bit, um, but you know, the more you start to progressively overload, the more you start to find stuff that used to be a challenge before actually is now it has now become your your warm up weight. So I think again, that's been always my encouragement to just start. Not be afraid yeah. of failure because you will grow in your capacity. But yeah. actually, when you make that thing a priority, you will also find ways to make space for it. Sure. So there's a bit of both. Yeah, uh, yeah. Finding Indeed. space to, to work with it, but also increasing your capacity at the same time. Yeah. So earlier, you know, one part of your hexagon is uh, it involves communication. Um, how does communication play out in ensuring that we stick to our action plan? Yeah. There is no point having a detailed operational plan if that is not communicated clearly to the people who are supposed to implement it. Very important that is. I want to give an example. Huh? Uh, Jeff Bezos, who is the richest man in the world, who leads Amazon, 
according to Brad Stone in his book, The Everything Store, the Amazon culture is notoriously confrontational. Bezos sets very high standard for himself and demands it from others when he communicates the operational plan to them. He says things like this, and I, I read it from the book. Are you lazy or incompetent? I'm sorry. Did I take my sleeping pills today? If I hear it again from you, I'm going to have to kill myself. I'm not suggesting we all become Jeff Bezos, but Jeff Bezos is highly confrontational. He sets a standard, he communicates to them, he expects them to do it. He expects everybody to run according to the plan. And he talks very robustly about the need for them to stick to the plan. He holds them accountable for it. It's so important that if you don't communicate and set expectation to people. People say, yeah, this operational plan, it's, it's just one of those things. We don't need to implement it. We don't need to do it. It will come to pass. It will go away. I think when you set it out there, it's so important to do it. When I run organization, Shell and BS, losing money for 10 years, Malaysia Alliance, they were losing money as well. We had only two and a half months of cash. I have to communicate very clearly to everybody, this is what we have to do. And I will hold everybody accountable to delivering it on a weekly basis. We're going to check who's delivered it. And we will reward those who delivered it. We will also make sure that those who don't deliver it have to face consequences. It's important to make sure that expectation is clear because then they will know this is important. So that communication is very, very important so that everybody knows that this operational plan is not just something that we'll write it down in a book, put in a, in a shelf there at the end of the year, we'll take it out and dust it. No, 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 it's going to be implemented. Yeah. I think another component to why communication is important, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier there is uh, something to be said for uh, clarity in terms of who is doing what and when. So, you know, communicating is important there. But also there's another component to it, which is the... The, the the purpose aspect. So this is a, it goes back to the true north, which we talked about last yeah. week. I think there's also a need to communicate often because actually in communicating properly, we also remind people of the true north for why we are doing the things yeah. we are doing. You know, there's we we often say that vision vision leaks, yeah. and so actually the this is something that I used to struggle with, but. I've realized my own personal learning as a leader is that actually your job as a leader is to consistently and mm. constantly remind people um, of of the vision of the true north, whatever you want to call it, uh, but to keep doing that because naturally yeah. your teams will, as they go through the day to day, it's it's easy to forget why we are doing why? what we are doing. So I think when you make it a point to not only communicate very clearly on the steps that need to be taken, yeah who is doing what, but also why. Uh, I think that is what will set up our teams to do, to do spot well. Spot on. I mean, the, the things that we, you and I have covered now in the last episode, we begin with the game, the impossible, set mm -hmm. impossible targets so that they will transform in order to do it. Second one is to make clear that the West is true north. So that it's very clear they will, can prioritize. So your point about the why is very important. It is absolutely right, Leon. When you get down to discipline, it's hard work. And if you don't convince people, it's a compelling reason why they have to do it, to suffer the, the hard work of having to do that, and they will find it very difficult to maintain the momentum. So making that very clear, and we talked about the idea of the promised land, as the Moses had mentioned before, it was so compelling for them. The promised land is far better than where they were in Egypt. So they didn't mind walking through and sleeping in the desert to get there because it was a very important and compelling place for them to go to. It's very important. You know, just going back to this, you, you, you used the Moses the, you know, uh, analogy. The next part of your hexagon is uh, after you know, we, we communicate clearly, the yeah. other key factor is then monitoring. Yeah. I wonder if we, were to re if we were to go back to Moses' time, yeah. where do you think the... Where do you think the monitoring aspect maybe plays out in that narrative? I think to begin with, as I said before, Moses' big mistake in my view, mm. when he said the true north, he didn't have timeline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He didn't say how long they're going to, to reach there. So he didn't, I mean, he prayed to God. 
I mean, he didn't ask God how long is his journey going to take. So that conversation was never documented in Exodus, nor in Deuteronomy. So there was no timeline associated to how long that Exodus was going to take place. That's the first problem. Because there was none of that, it was very difficult for them to monitor progress and timelines according to that that duration period. So I think that was a big mistake in the way in which they, he was creating the true north, nor were they able to create milestones which I can measure on a yearly basis or monthly basis and weekly basis. There's no timeline. Yeah. So that was a big mistake on, on the part of Moses, in my view. So if Moses had, uh, had access to Pamandu in that time, how yeah. would Pamandu have uh, put in place some monitoring yeah. uh, accountability processes yeah. Uh, yeah. or structures. Yeah, that, you uh, don't have to ask me when Pamandu to help Moses. Moses could have asked Nehemiah mm. because in the book Nehemiah is very clear. He focused exactly to the T. That's why they were able to, to build the wall within 53 days. They organized themselves exactly how to do that. So I think Nehemiah, I would say in the, in the, in the Bible, it's the MBA of the Bible because it has planning, it's an organization, it's got step-by-step -step discipline of action, how they're going to, it's got timeline. They were really very, very good. It's absolutely good. So if I was to, to advise Moses, we would have run the labs. We would have run the labs. And I think if they crossed the Red Sea and the, the, the Egyptians, were, the soldiers were no longer chasing them, that would have been an opportune moment mm. for them to sit down there and run the labs. Yeah. They should have asked God, What's the timeline? And then from then on, they should cut them into activities and what they were going to do. Mm. And there's people that debate, perhaps they spend more than 40 years in the desert. It could have been a week that if they really went straight line and they had a proper way how to do it, maybe a month or so. Yeah. You know, they say that people will do what you inspect, not what you expect. Exactly. I think there's a point at which the... Um, the motivation needs to change because I think for most people, this would still largely be a, in a way, a fear-based yeah, yeah. motivation, in the right? Because you know that it's being inspected. Um, how do you start to move it from that into being truly just a part of the DNA yeah. of your teams, where that sense of urgency is is inherent by virtue of them being passionate about the outcome or the you know the intended yeah. outcome? It all boils down to results. And if you can get some quick wins, the quicker you get the quick wins, the more, the quicker the organization will reach a point of inflection. The quick wins is to convince people this painful journey that we're going through is worth it. And they will only agree if it's worth it, if the results is definitely there. So when you get the results in the first month and you communicate the results to the, the whole uh, people within the organization, you will see wow, people are beginning to have a sense of victory. You know, if you're defeated as an organization, 10 years of losing money, Shell MDS, every single year you're know, losing money, the organization, they are defeated. But when I went there in the first month, we were beginning to post the profit. I could sense a jubilance going through the organization. And the next month with the results coming out, the monitoring, and they start rewarding people who delivered it on a monthly basis, you will see an inflection taking place. An organization whose morale was going down, the inflection point still comes. The inflection points come through results delivery. Mm. No results, no inflection point. Yeah. No results, there is no positivities that coming out. Yes. The, it has to come through results. Yeah. Which also goes back to uh, actually another key component of uh, communication. Yeah. Because actually your communications systems or structures should also be able to, you know, communicate clearly on on results and outcomes as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yep. So you have, you have feedback of, okay, the team knows that things are moving and now we are motivated to continue to see that happen. I suppose it's the same with yeah. Our, you know, our physical endeavors. You and your tennis, me and my my running, and and sometimes my weights. You you realize that it's in moments where you start to see progress that it really solidifies the the discipline. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think is a good segue to move to the next, the fourth aspect of the hexagon. Huh? You know, when I mentioned the third one was a dashboard to monitor. The fourth aspect is the discipline of action means you have to hold people accountable. And so you have to refrain from 
jumping inside there and making yourself as the boss accountable for it but you really must make the person who is accountable accountable yeah actually that is something that i've personally uh, struggled with in the past I, i would think i'm a lot better at it now but i think in the past there was always this tendency to you know it's perhaps a misinterpretation of discipline of action but in my in my younger days i took discipline of action to mean that i needed to be seen to be doing everything mm. yeah. and that my value um, as a team member or even as a leader is in my ability to hold the most number of roles and to yeah. take the most responsibility for everything you know having a very politician yeah. uh, approach <laughs> to leading a team la um, but then what i quickly realize is that while that might have worked well for me as an individual in um, achieving certain things that might look you know that that might might, might put me in in good stead with my with my managers what i realized the 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 trade off there actually is that i would actually argue that i in those periods was not a very good leader mm. i was able to achieve the stuff hit all of our goals but at the detriment of our teams uh, detriment of our teams meaning at the detriment of their uh, their growth um and i used to often wonder why is it that why am i still in a place where i have to to carry everything yeah. and then the real point of reflection was realizing that yeah the the team is not able to do that because so long as you continue to yeah. hoard it they're never going to learn and you'll continually find yourself in the cycle of having to to do the thing yourself um so that has been something that i've thought about a lot about lately actually and i've learned um you know learn a lot about which is actually how do you have more of a um, an attitude of raising and releasing others and so this example you know this 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 note of kind of not taking on the responsibility yeah. but giving empowering you know the the person in question to yeah. develop the solution absolutely is actually also very uh, empowering for that person absolutely you know, number one it it yeah. adds pressure yeah. but actually it's in that in yeah. that time when you're really back against the wall and you're trying to figure this out for yourself yeah. Those are usually moments you will look back and say, "Well, actually, that is I learned the most in that yeah. time." And I would say that, in the heat of the moment, there have been points that uh, there have been times where perhaps my my manager has done the same thing to say, well, "Why don't you figure it out?" Yeah. And I have caught myself in my you know early earlier parts of my career thinking, "Why is this?" why is this fella so lazy you know <laughs> why can't he just give me a solution you've got the experience why are you unwilling to to solve it with me yeah but i've realized that that has been the most those have been the most valuable parts of my learning you know being being given the responsibility to say why don't you figure it out yeah, yeah, yourself absolutely. there very, be no very learning important. without that it reminds me leon many years ago when i worked for shell in london we invited the guy who was the coach for the british athletics Uh, his name was Frank Dick, a relatively uh, unfortunate name for. <laughs> <laughs> that is his name, <coughs> and we asked him to explain to us the secret of success in Olympic games. And he was the one who coached uh, Linford Christie and others. Uh, he really, really focused on making sure that people working in a team must really f- do their part and uh, holding them accountable. And he related the story. This is from him. He said. When Maradona was playing for the Argentinian team, the coach or the manager Carlos Menotti, he said it very clear to everyone in the team that we have a star player in our team, Maradona. This guy is so gifted, but his both his left and right foot, but his his left foot is so outstanding. But that is his advantage. So he made it very clear as a task among all the players in the team I'm going to monitor you and hold you accountable every single one of you your job is when you pass the ball to Maradona pass it to his left foot and if you pass it 10 times to him five times to the left and the right you're no good I want 9 out of 10 of the passes that are to Maradona to his left foot because then he can move much faster to beat the opponents so every game he has a tick how many time each of the players pass it to his left or in right foot and he will hold them accountable for that monitoring and that's why they were really able to build a team around maradona 
That's when you say, how do you build a team around the star player? And that is utilize his strength. So the discipline of action, holding the accountable for a very specific task of sending the ball mm. directly to his left foot. It was the little thing for them to do as a team. It was such an important thing. You know, it's very, very important. And that's why when you do it, it's important to make sure that people know exactly why you're doing it to your earlier point. That's how they became champion. What's your approach to problem solving and problem solving well? Problem solving, when you want to do it well, it must have making sure that there's an automatic escalation. That means in a department, in a week, one person is supposed to implement it. If the person cannot solve the problem, there must be an automatic escalation to the boss. And the boss is given a specific time frame to resolve it. When the boss would say the department head cannot resolve it, he needs automatically to move to escalate it to the next manager and then finally to the CEO. Why is that important? It's because problems that cannot be resolved tend to be put under the carpet. That's what happens in most organizations because people keep them under the carpet. There's not an automatic escalation. So it can be sitting out there for years and years, the problems are unresolved because nobody is raising it up for a solution to be resolved there. And uh, that, I think, is a very important component. I would say a lot of people do problem solving, but they don't have an automatic escalation. And that automatic escalation forced the organization to have the discipline to resolve the problem. Can you define what you mean by automatic um, escalation? Timeline. Time I mean, giving them one, one week, mm. if you can't resolve within one week, yeah. automatically it will move to the next. So you look at the traffic so light. it's usually a, it's a time, time bound time framework. Bound. Like yeah, you can do it one a month. So you have the dashboard and everything that is red color over mm -hmm. the dashboard over a period of time automatically yep. gets escalated. And yep. the person who's supposed to resolve it will get a trigger via an email to say that you now have this problem to yep. try and resolve it. So e essentially... So it's different to like a medical, let's say like a like triage yeah. in a medical context because that one is... Referral. Things that, yeah, it's referral yeah. and based on the diagnosis, based yeah. on the, the category of problem. But in this case, actually, it's, it's perhaps quite quite a, a more simple approach. Which Very simple. Is just purely time bound. Time bound. And it means that actually we're not limiting responsibilities. You you are more than welcome to try to figure out the problem. However, if you are not able to do it within this time frame, then it gets escalated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and another one was that if the problem is endemic and everybody uh, seems to be unable to resolve it, it gets to the highest level, which is the final level. In a government will be the prime minister. In the in the company, it will be the CEO or maybe the chairman of the board. When it reaches that level, we do not call it problem solving. We call it inquisition. Because when it gets to that level... This, at home, this is when an issue <laughs> has escalated to Andrea, my wife. <laughs> Crisis. So when it reaches that level, it's no longer problem solving, inquisition. In an inquisition, it will be like this. We have a template for the problem solving. And in the problem solving, there is an in the template problem statement couple of lines and then they will say who is the person blocking the problem from being solved name the person and that person will be summoned to go to the ceo or the the, the prime minister to explain why he or she is a stumbling block for this problem to be resolved i can tell you leon my experience in all this more than 70 percent of the problems is resolved before the meeting before the Inquisition, because nobody wants to go there mm. to tell the CEO and the Prime Minister, I am the reason, the stumbling block for this to happen. And so I think they will find a solution to that. And the reason why we do this is like a nuclear bomb. Nuclear bomb is a deterrent. Mm. It shouldn't be pressed. So people know that they don't want to <laughs> go there and be summoned to, a, to, be an, to an Inquisition, because yeah. otherwise it is a naming and shaming. Yeah. So I think if you do it like that, so you have two mechanisms for an effective problem solving. One, an automatic escalation that's time bound. Two, when it is endemic and cannot be resolved, it needs to shift into an inquisition. I'd like to get your thoughts on this. So there's been a, uh, there's been a phenomenon of this thing that they call uh, toxic productivity now. 
um and you know that is the that is a, that is if you like the uh, the opposing force to another phenomenon called hustle culture hustle hustle culture um which especially started to 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 take off around i think in between 2018 2020 um hustle culture is people who advocate um hard work mm. you know so the, the 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 principle of hard work is, is is fantastic and that's why it took off because you know the the, the spirit of it is is good la. we're encouraging mm. people to you know to have a to have a work ethic and to have discipline in the things that they do but i think where it started to go south is that you it it started to breed uh <laughs> maybe a, a type of people or a type of worker mm. uh, that was very only performance oriented and then you know usually that would come at the expense of of other people uh, yeah. uh, or even sometimes at the expense of themselves as we've seen with the the rise of people suffering from um, mm. anxiety but also yeah. burnout uh so in response to that now they have they have termed this thing called toxic pr productivity mm. where you are doing things but no longer no longer necessarily aligned to a, a noble Right. Not yeah, yeah, purely yeah. for the sake of yeah, showing yeah. others that uh, I can do more. Yeah, yeah. Um, in light of that, how do we adopt a healthy approach to uh, discipline and, and, and doing things in a, in a sustainable manner as well? One of the very useful things that we introduce uh, in Pamandu, and uh, it's a very important technique in what we call ESSA. E-S-S-A. If you look at an organization to avoid the toxic culture, you must return to the true north and visit whether the true north is still valid. And then you ask the question on the E side, how do you eliminate unnecessary activities, meetings, documents, writing activities that are completely unnecessary to achieve that objective? So when you identify them, you eliminate them, you get rid of them. So a lot of people are doing work that are completely unrelated to what we really want to do. Mm. So they're busy doing it. And so if you do that, they release them from the unnecessary amount of work. So you e eliminate. After that, you eliminate them. Some of them, you don't eliminate them, but you need to simplify them. Because they're too complicated. There are 10 steps to do it. Can we reduce the steps so that it become only two steps or three steps? Do you simplify the, the bureaucracy, the processes? You know, in fact, if you have 20 meetings on safety, why do you have 20? Why can't we have only five meetings? Why do you have 50 people attending the meeting when only five people need to be there? So you, you simplify. After you simplify them, you might find that there are people who customize them in various departments. Why don't you standardize them? So we standardize them. When you standardize them, rather than you customize them, that's another level of removing unnecessary work. After you've done all that, you might find that you could reduce unnecessary work that will cause a lot of toxic culture that exists in organization. I call them chronic waste. Then you move into the A, which is to automate it. Can you do many of these things that we do manually in a manner that's automated, that will reduce the amount of hard work that's required? So if you follow the SR, E-S-S-A, you will get rid of unnecessary work that contributes to a toxic culture. And when you start doing that, you may find people who said, wow, all this while I was doing things that I knew was unnecessary. And I knew it was totally not important because my boss never read my report. Mm. And I was there because it was part of my job description I needed to do it. When you get rid of that, then people are saying, I now am prepared to take on more responsibility yeah. because I now have removed the things that were unnecessary. But I begin of the view that when you do this, it's very important. I, I'm caught, I'm chairman of Hanukkah Malaysia. So during the pandemic, it was very difficult. The mm. pubs were closed, the bars were closed. We can't sell any of our beers anymore in any of this. So I then mentioned it to uh, Roland Bala, who is the CEO. I said, Roland, we got much little to do why don't we implement ESA to really find things that we can clear out, really use the two-year period to clean up house so that when the pandemic is over, we can ride the wave and run with it. The same thing with, with Sunway. I'm co-chairman of Sunway Group. 
I had a good meeting with Tan Sri Chiu, who is the president. I said, Tan Sri Chiu, why don't we use this two-year period to clean up house, implement ESA across the board? And we went to implement ESA. We went step by step to look at meetings, look at report, look at activities, and look at processes to really get rid of things that were unnecessary, freeing up a lot of time. I'm of the view, Leon, that if you want to address the toxic culture, you have to get rid of work. I've been very fortunate early in my career. In 1986, it might have been 87, I was sent to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Crotonville, and I went to see what Jack Wells was doing in General Electric in Crotonville. And they had this thing called workout. Workout is a term where in General Electric, they look at activities and processes and meetings and report that were absolutely unnecessary to work. And they tried to get rid of that work. And that was what they did. It was really phenomenal they were able to do it. And so it was wonder wonderful because the... Uh, the tagline at the time was Jack Wells. They wanted to have the most productive company on earth. To be the most productive company on earth, you got to get rid of unproductive work. And that's why they did the workout. And so and that's how I, I learned very early on this idea of getting rid of unnecessary work and you know, simplifying things. And if you do that, I think you'll find a solution to the toxicity that exists in many organizations. Yeah, I mean another another way that we tackle it in my in my church and in the the, the wider hub uh, alpha hub that we sit within, um, this is more of, perhaps more of a being thing. So this is how you how, this is how you 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 um, create structures to mm. change your doing yeah. uh, in order to eliminate a, a toxic culture. But in this case, we have a, also a different approach, uh, and we have this saying where you know ultimately a culture is shaped by what you celebrate, but also what you tolerate. Mm. You know, so if you tolerate unnecessary work, yeah. then naturally we will be in an environment that accepts that to be the norm. Um, so one, one very practical way that this works out um, is you know, we, we've, especially in our department, I think we're a department that is very deliverables heavy. So naturally we, are, we, we work very hard. Um, but the question we ask ourselves is, how do we eliminate this kind of uh, badge of honor tied to working longer hours, uh, which I personally have been guilty on in, in my previous work, you know, and, and I used to, I remember it's very silly now when I think of it, but <laughs> when I, if I were to work up until 4.35 a.m., I would post a picture of it. That that is that is really what toxic productivity yeah, yeah. is. Feeling the need to show off yeah. that you have worked past a certain, uh, you know, a couple of hours, and almost devaluing other members of the team yeah, who yeah. might actually be working more efficiently oh, yeah. than you, and <laughs> still producing the same outcome. You know, so we've. We, we've asked ourselves, how do we prevent that from happening? So we do simple things like if somebody has, because naturally we'll be, we will be in uh, cases where people put in, uh, have to put in some long hours um, to get things done. We always make sure that we thank them for the, the outcome of the work and that we try not to use language like, thank you for working until so late on yeah, this. Yeah, we sure. would just celebrate what was the, the outcome. And hopefully, that just means if we have to work late, we're working late because the project just required that and not because I know if I work late, I'm going to get praise from my team or from my manager. Mm. So it's little shifts <laughs> in language, which I found very interesting yeah, yeah. because I've often also thought of it from what are, what are practical things we can do and structures we can mm. put in place. But sometimes there are little things yeah, yeah. in our semantics and language that can also change behavior. Yeah. You know, to, to close, maybe taking a more philosophical um, angle, if the key to so much success in life and the key to just any amazing achievements in life is actually not as complicated as talent, but it's really as simple as putting in the work and having a discipline of action, why do you think, um, why do you think there are so many people um, that go to their graves not achieving their full potential? I think the, no, number one is, as I said before, they don't set impossible targets. And you know, my, in the earlier session, I said before, the reason for impossible target is not so much about the results. That's very important. But the transformation that happens so that you get to transform to become the best version of yourself so before you go to your grave. 
And so the third reason for doing that, and as she said, if you put that game the impossible, you understand the true north, you then know exactly the step by step, what are the things you need to do. And if you can implement those very simple things that are in the operational plans and do it as we discussed, find a discipline, you'll be surprised at how much you can deliver. Time and again, I work in an organization, the same people who are in that same organization had been losing money continuously for a prolonged period of time. In no time at all, we turn around the company and make record profits. It's the same people. There was no silver bullets in the solutions. There was no rocket science in it. It's just simple stuff. Yeah. Simple stuff is usually the key <laughs> and the trick to many, many big accomplishments. Um, thanks, Dad, for, for today's session on Discipline of Action. It's been, it's been a good refresher for me as well, uh, as this is something that I continue to want to be better at. Um, next week, we will be talking about situational leadership, the Absolutely. next chapter in your book. Um, for our viewers, viewer, listener, uh, however many of you uh, actually tune into this, uh, can you give us a, a taster of what we can expect? Uh, situational leadership is uh, the idea that when you start a journey, you will have to exercise very different leadership style at the start of the journey. And as the team progress and they become more and more competent at doing it, in your leadership style, you need to be able to be ambidextrous to change your style, to, to suit the different phases of the organization. Most leaders today, we are only one dimension. If you're directive style, you're only doing that the whole time. If you're the empowering style, and you're only empowering the whole time. But situational leadership allows you to be ambidextrous, to change your style depending on not on your ego, not on your whims and fancy, but on the team development. As the team develops and they are competent at doing it, then your style in leadership needs to change. And that's based on the situation. The situation is the change of the competency and the capability of the team. Very good. Look forward to unpacking that with yeah. you. Thanks so much for joining us uh, on this week's episode of The Game of Impossible. We look forward to speaking with you all again next week.